thanks, Nate, for, um, for your introduction and for including us in this year's Sal Colloquia. Um, I've said this before, Nate always makes these things feel like an occasion, so I really appreciate, um, I appreciate your introduction very much. Thanks, too, to Tammy Ostrander and Mary Lee for the logistical support for the eats in the back, and by all means, uh, help yourselves uh, as, as uh, time goes on here. Todd and I are glad to be part of this year's Sal Colloquia. We're also glad our talk uh, this afternoon is part of the calendar of events surrounding the Folger Library Shakespeare First Folio exhibit at the Tweed Museum UMD. It's the Minnesota stop on a national book tour marking the 400th anniversary of William Shakespeare's death. Thanks to uh, Ken, UMD's Ken Bloom, Matt Rosendahl, and Krista Tu for spearheading and organizing the First Folio exhibit in Duluth and for including our efforts uh, this afternoon on the exhibit's events schedule. Finally, I'd like to thank my co-presenter, Todd White, uh, for not only agreeing to another of my schemes, but also, and most importantly for me, carrying most of the weight, literally, in the preparation for and in what we are about to do, experience these next 60 minutes or so. Our lecture this afternoon grows out of our collaborative work, and, and Nate kind of reviewed some of that. Todd and I have team taught on a number of occasions in the past 16 years seminars and courses that integrate manuscript and early printing book production as part of course content. With help from master calligrapher Meredith Schiffsky, we've uh, produced, uh, uh, generated four manuscript books. We've also generated six print, uh, limited run print books and a broadside on the rule of St. Benedict. We've spoken about our work at regional, and national, and international conferences. We co-authored an article in Studies in Medieval Renaissance Teaching. Today we wish to apply some of what we've learned on the way to understanding Shakespeare's books. Between the two of us, we will talk about 25 or 30 minutes before inviting you to a hands-on printing workshop. So turning to the business at hand, let me begin by unpacking a little the title of our presentation. So the first half of the title will be the subject of my remarks, and Todd gets the second half. Implicit in the first half of the title, Making Shakespeare's Books, are two key aspects of medieval and early modern culture that have long drawn my attention and interest, materiality and performance. I'd like to further unpack these two terms, their connection to each other, and how they help us understand the making of Shakespeare's books. Since my first encounters as a child with what I later come to understand as medieval and early modern cultures, I found fascinating the material detritus of the past extant in European buildings and streets, in greens and alleyways, in city walls, fortified castles and village churches, in handmade books and libraries, in objects like whalebone carvings and metalwork, in paintings in museums, sculptures on cathedrals, tapestries on walls, even in linguistic elements surviving in surnames and place names. And of course, we find traces of the medieval and early modern in our own very Midwestern American city of Duluth. And here we are, surrounded by the medieval at this moment, okay, in Tower Hall. Understanding these bits and what they might reveal to us of past peoples and cultures, including our college's founders, helps us engage that past in the present as we look to the future. Performance, too, the human in action, is an aspect of culture that material bits suggest and imply. A medieval church or cathedral, here Durham Cathedral, hints of liturgies performed in the past by clerics, monks, nuns, and laity long dead who once tread lightly across the same pavements we tread when visiting. A 16th century royal palace, here Henry VIII's Hampton Court Palace and Great Hall, evokes in its features courtly life surrounding 16th and 17th century English royalty including numerous feasts and after-dinner entertainments, such as the King's Men's Christmas season performances in 1603 for the newly crowned King James I. When I think about that performance, they, they were just been renamed the King's Men, and they're performing for the King, and I'm imagining that they were quite nervous when they're waiting to perform in this hall. A battlefield draped in crops today here, Flodden in northern England, the site of uh, Scotland's great defeat on September 9th, 1513, hides in its peacefulness desperate actions performed by thousands on a late afternoon 503 years ago. Or a manuscript folio. Here, an image of a relatively plain book, 
Bodleian Library Manuscript 3462, dated around 1250, that reveals on close examination the letters ductus, that is, the direction, sequencing, and speed of the stroke patterns shaping each letter, and we begin to see the scribe's hand move across the line forming each letter. Vestiges of a performance of another kind on a day centuries ago that we can almost touch in our present tense moment of close reading. And see the scribe's hand moving across the page. And sometimes these material bits and hints of performance encourages us uh, to performances of our own, attempts to understand from the inside, if you will, as best we can given the limitations of our own historical cultural moment. This image, a folio 11V of British Library Manuscript Harley 978, dated about 1260, 1265, offers a case in point. The score, text, and rubrics of this manuscript folio mediates at least two performances, the one it records and the one it cues. There are also two more, a revision of the melody and the performance it implies. So the score and text then practically insist we try to figure out the song. How might it uh, sound to sing the text according to the notation? And how does that notation work exactly? For those of you familiar with this text, and I know there are a few of you in this room, I wonder if your experience of it was something like mine. Here's how I first encountered it. In Thomas Garbati's edited, punctuated, glossed, and noted version in his Medieval English Literature Anthology, the main textbook in Valerie Ligorio's Middle English Language and Literature course at the University of Iowa fall semester 1989. Here's Garbati again with a transcription from the manuscript. I was grateful then for Garbati's uh, apparatus and edition as I worked to master Middle English, and my dominant memory of the reading experience is delight. After all, the visual oral images of bleeding ewes, lowing cows, jumping bulls, and farting bucks or breaks wind, okay, and what I'm talking about is this bit right here, this stanza, okay? Uh, breaks wind as Garbati politely glosses verteth at line 10, that, that particular word right there, farts. Um, are ones not soon to leave the memory, either short term or long. This text is stuck in my mind. I thought, about the, po I thought the poem was a blast, and still do, uh, pun intended. Yet in spite of Garbati's head note describing the text as the only secular lyric in the man manuscript, con manuscript containing mainly Latin and French music, a rota or round, a double canon for six voices, the fact that it had a score cueing a six-voice performance was more or less lost on me at the time. Not having access then to a facsimile, I didn't give the poem's implied performance much thought until five years later, during my first year on this campus. One day while working in my office, just a few doors down from here, the door opened as was my custom, I happened to hear what sounded like sung Middle English emanating from Tower 4125 across the hallway. I got up and moved into the hallway so as to listen better and heard George Killo and his intro to poetry class sing Summer is a Kuminen. It was the first time I heard the text off the page. With that group of students, George was doing what the manuscript copy invites any of its readers to do, try to figure out what the text and score sound like when voiced. They were engaging it from the inside through performance, and they too were having a blast, I think. George was, anyway. <laughs> For me, then, this image of a 13th century manuscript copy of a Middle English poem encapsulates the relationship between the ideas of materiality and performance I've been working to explicate here. For it is in material bits like the text and score inscribed on folio 11V of British Library Manuscript Harley 978 that we find traces and hints of performances from early cultures which in turn reveal riches of past human experiences in their embodiment, their expression of human life in and perspectives on the world. Now something similar might be guardedly said of Shakespeare's first folio. So we're getting to Shakespeare's books. Published late in the year of 1623 by William and Isaac Jaggard in association with three other London bookseller publishers, William Aspley, John Smethick, and Edward Blunt. Dedicated to the Earls of Pembroke and Montgomery and addressed to the great variety of readers, Shakespeare's first folio anthologizes in a single volume 36 of the Bard's 38 known plays. 
and for 18 of the plays, that is half in the collection, the book offers the earliest extant copy of the text. The book's textual history is complex, one I'll not try to untangle fully today, but its outlines offer a quick overview of early modern printed book production. Let me state the obvious from the start. Shakespeare had nothing to do with seeing the first folio through the press. Nothing, okay? Isaac Jagger and Edward Blunt published it, after all, over seven and a half years after the playwright died on April 23rd, 1616. We don't know if he would have approved the texts as they exist in the book, a point that may unsettle some 21st century readers used to assuming any book or text reproduces exactly what the author wrote, a sort of authorial fundamentalism. However, as the title page claims, published according to the true original copies right there, you can't really see it, but it does say that. The book has a link to what we can surmise the author did write. A key force behind the book was the King's Men, Shakespeare's company, particularly John Hemming and Henry Condell, two of Shakespeare's oldest acting colleagues. Another force, it seems, was Shakespeare's fellow playwright, Ben Johnson, who, in addition to writing a dedicatory poem for the book, had published, as any of you who heard Paul Cannon speak at the exhibit's grand opening know, a collection of his own plays, The Year Shakespeare Died, 1616. With his works, printed in London by William Stansby, Johnson took his cue from an established practice of presenting classical texts in single author anthologies. In many respects, he seems to have translated the idea of a single, uh, uh, pardon me, of a single volume authorial collection of classical texts into a similar collection of contemporary plays, a collection that would express, even construct, a playwright's literary life for an audience of readers. Now, this is a 1502 printing of Virgil's opera, and of course, Johnson translates opera directly, works. So I, I think he's really got this in mind. That the compilers of Shakespeare's first folio had something similar in mind is evident from the letter signed by Hemming and Condell, in which they, or their ghostwriter, as some scholars have argued, state, it had been a thing, we confess, sorry, sticky fingers, worthy to have been wished that the author himself had lived to have set forth and, over, and overseen his own writings. But since it hath been ordained otherwise, and he by death departed from that right, we pray you, do not envy his friends the office of their care and pain to have collected and published them. I'd like to note three key points uh, implicit in this prologue letter. First, the author's construction of the book's audience as readers. The first folio is primarily a readerly text by intention. Second, their claim to be only exercising a right and performing an office Shakespeare himself would have done had he lived. And third, their evident care in constructing this monument, this book, to the memory of their dead friend. As they state a bit further on in the letter, his mind and hand went together, and what he thought he uttered with that easiness that we have scarce received from him a blot in his papers. What they publish here, according to the true original copies, they state, carries the authority, the authorial press of pen on paper, blotted or otherwise, of a book overseen by Shakespeare himself. That's their claim. They are uh, mere vehicles or conduits of the bard's will. Another bad pun. Did you catch bard's will? Yeah, forget it. All right, back to the book's production for a moment. When gathering text for printer's copy, those behind editing and publishing the first folio drew on a number of resources at hand, many of which seem to have included Shakespeare's foul papers or transcripts thereof. Now, the term foul papers refers in the context of Elizabethan Jacobean theater uh, to the playwright's working draft. From foul papers, and here's a schema of how this word would work. From foul papers, either the author or a scribe, perhaps hired by a theater company, produced a fair copy that became the basis for the book of the play, the prompt copy prepared by the company bookkeeper, which in turn was submitted for license to the master of the rebels. Once the play was licensed, the company was free to stage it, which involved study and rehearsal, including parts copies, as gently satirized in, a, in Midsummer Night's Dream, and instructions and revisions as staged in Hamlet. The process of a play text, from idea 
to moments before its premiere as actors waited to take the stage was recursive and collaborative with typically multiple revisions. Staging a play was its first publication, an ephemeral performance for auditor spectators. Any subsequent printed version, whether based on foul papers, fair copy, prompt book, or actor's memory, was the play's second publication, a printed copy for readers. I don't want to overstate the distance between Shakespeare's inkwell and Jaggard's inkpot, but knowing the general outline of publication helps us begin to understand and appreciate the results of their work. We owe much to their efforts, both record of and ultimately cue for performances, whether private reading or public staging. The first folio, in its materiality, has been a key means for transmitting Shakespeare's plays to the present day. As the subhead of the Shakespeare's folio, uh, first folio exhibit declares, um, it is in many respects the book that gave us Shakespeare. And here I kind of part ways with Paul Cannon, for those of you who happen to hear his talk, just slightly. And I would add, performance is cued from texts in, in this book since its publication in 1623 have, in a very real sense, given us the first folio, okay? A book that's behind glass, glass that if you touch an alarm is gonna go off, okay? Um, in all its iconic force. Uh, just a quick sidebar story. Um, Bodleian Library uh, has, uh, purchased a, a copy in 1624. It's the earliest record of a purchase of the first folio. In 1664, they sold that copy because they purchased a copy of the third edition. They didn't need the first edition anymore. <laughs> okay, so they got rid of it. Some years later, they tracked down that first folio copy that they had owned originally, and they purchased it back because in the interval, the first folio had become very important. Okay, what made it important? I think staging uh, Shakespeare's plays. Okay, so no big shakes there, but really. About 750 copies of this book were printed. 230 survive today. Folger Library owns 82. So it's not a rare book. It's not a rare book, but it's a valuable book. Um, uh, a few years ago, I had a chance to actually mess about with one and uh, realized that I was holding about $5 million in my hands when I was doing it. So, right. So in uh, 2016 is a banner year for all things Shakespeare as we mark the 400th anniversary of his death with events like the Folger Library Shakespeare's first folio exhibit at the Tweed Museum. It also marks anniversaries of other events and their related materiality. In addition to the already noted anniversary of Ben Jonson's first folio, remember that was printed in 1616, uh, 2016 marks the 400th anniversary of the death of Miguel Cervantes, author of Don Quixote. It marks the 500th anniversary of uh, the printing of Thomas More's Utopia, the book that gave us the term and spawned a range of utopian and dystopian texts down to the present day. Last Friday, October 14th, we marked the 950th anniversary of the Battle of Hastings, a name-changing as well as game-changing performance by William the Bastard of Normandy that claimed England's last Anglo-Saxon king, Harold Godwinson, turned William into a conqueror and ultimately left in its wake many material and cultural bits, including the Tower of London, Middle English, and the Bayou Tapestry, which I like to think of as an early graphic novel. And a date that just passed this le uh, less than four weeks ago, September 25th, marked the 1300th anniversary of the death of Chalfrith, teacher of the Venerable Bede and third abbot of the twin Benedictine foundation, Monk Wearmouth and Jarrow in the kingdom of Northumbria, modern day Northern England. Following the near annihilation of the Jarrow community in 686 due to plague, only Chalfrith and Bede survived. The abbot worked to rebuild the community and expand both houses. In about 692, so within six years, Chalfrith commissioned from his monastic scriptoria three pandects Pandek is a, a single volume copy of the Bible that, that would have taken great material resources and human effort to complete. Leaving one at each monastic church in Monk Wearmouth and in Jarrow, he set out at the age of 74 for Rome in June 716 with the third copy, intending to give it to the Pope. He died en route, and apparently the book never made it to Rome. This third Pandek, the Codex Amiatinus, ended up in the Abbey of the Savior, Mount Amiata, Tuscany, and is now in Florence, Italy. And of the three pandics, 
It's the only one that survives. Okay? Fragments of the other two survive. And the British Library has about 13 leaves from the other two. This is the oldest extant single volume copy of the Vulgate Bible. This remarkable large format manuscript book offers material evidence of scribal, artistic, communal, and individual efforts. Vestiges of performances over 1,300 years ago within the context of a then young, vibrant Northumbrian Benedictine mon monastic community. So, back to Shakespeare, the making of his books, and our own performance of sorts. Let's turn for a few moments to his sonnet collection. Let's really do it. There we go. Unlike the first folio, Shakespeare's sonnets was first printed in 1609 while the bard was still living. Using a press like this one at Planton Moratus in Antwerp that was built in 1600, and working in a shop resembling the one depicted in this woodcut slide, Thomas Thorpe printed the sonnets and distributed them through two booksellers, William Aspley, who was involved in the later distribution of the first folio, and John Wright. Though there's no evidence that Shakespeare had a hand in seeing his plays through the press, he was engaged in printing his early poetry, Venus and Adonis in 1593 and The Rape of Lucrece in 1594. The same cannot be said, however, for the 1609 sonnets, the condition of which suggests Shakespeare likely didn't have a hand in their printed publication. At least some of his sonnets, on the other hand, were circulating in manuscript over a decade before. For Francis Mares declares, uh, declaring the sweet, witty soul of Ovid uh, lives in mellifluous and honey-tongued Shakespeare, referred to his sugared sonnets among his private friends in 1598. And there's the text, his sugared sonnets among his private friends. And two of the sonnets appeared in 1599 in the Passionate Pilgrim miscellany of 30 poems, a collection William Jaggard of, of subsequent first folio fame attributed entirely to Shakespeare, presumably for marketing purposes. Two of the sonnets are his, the other, well, then three other poems, and then the other 25 poems are other people's. According to Thomas Haywood, a fellow playwright actor whose work Jaggard, uh, Jaggard also pirated, uh, Shakespeare was much offended with Master Jagger that altogether unknown to him uh, presumed to make so bold with his name. Unlike with Johnson and other Elizabethan Jacobean writers, Shakespeare's rela relationship to the printing press is difficult to parse, but just as with the play's printers, we owe much to Thomas Thorpe's printed edition as none of the 1590s manuscript copies of these poems survive. None survive. Though the persona of Sonnet 55 audaciously claims, not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme, the poet's rhymes likely wouldn't have survived without the pressman's performance. So what was it like for Thomas Thorpe, William Jaggard, or Isaac Jaggard to produce a printed text? Let's see what we can find out. I'll turn it over to Todd. I thought I would begin my portion of the talk with an apology that is based on an apology. In 2009, Penguin Press published a book by Matthew Crawford titled Shotcraft is Soulcraft, an inquiry into the value of work. Crawford earned a PhD in political philosophy and found work at a think tank churning out position papers. Becoming disillusioned, he left to become, as all such authors of such books, books do, a motorcycle mechanic. <laughs> Crawford argues in his book that we have created a modern dichotomy where people are defined by either working with their hands or working with their heads, with the knowledge workers of our virtual economy being obviously superior. But Crawford believes it is foolish to dismiss people who work with their hands as not working with their heads, and that actually humans are truly and fully engaged when their heads and hands work together. As an early proof in his argument, Crawford offers the words of an ancient Greek philosopher. Anaxagoras. Thank you. I've been terrified of pronouncing that, so Bill is my official pronouncer of this particular word. So I've got it wrong with philosophy. Here he is portrayed in a stock illustration from the 15th century book, The Nuremberg Chronicles. 
It is by having hands that man is the most intelligent of animals. I've loved this quote from the moment I read it. If you ask me why anyone would print books by hand in our digital world, where such apps as Snapchat are redefining the meaning of ephemera, or if you ask me why I bought a 120-year-old, 1,200-pound cast iron printing press <laughs> 20 years ago, the answer would be in this quote from 2,500 years ago that I did not even know of. For me, I feel challenged the most and fulfill the most when my head and my hands are working together. If all politics are local, then maybe we can argue that all philosophy is local too. So I will add a proof to Crawford's argument in the form of a question based on her shared experience living in Duluth. But before I do, I would like you to take a moment to reflect on the many years of education that have led you to be sitting in this room. And then to look around you and try to calculate the combined years of book learning that we share together. And now I ask you, do you think that either you individually or all of us collectively are intelligent enough to outwit this individual who has spent his entire life engaging his hands and his head? <laughs> this is a page from the works of Xenophon, which was published in Frankfurt in 1592. It's part of our former librarian and college president, Sister Joan Brown's rare book collection. And this particular book is over on the table, and you will have the opportunity to examine it in just a bit. It is a beautiful work published in double columns which, with matching text in Latin and in Greek. And when you look at this book, realize that each letter, each piece of punctuation, each space between words is a physical object that had to be designed and created and assembled by skilled craftspeople. What I'd like to do now is show you a few slides that take you through the process of how that creation occurred. But before I do, one note I've been thinking on. Before I glorify working with your hands too much, don't forget that it is still work. Printing has always been a business and an industry. In the book class that Bill and I teach, students love the calligraphy and the illumination, but the delight fades a bit when it comes to setting type. I've thought about this over the years, and I think it is because of the loss of creative autonomy. Even when working under supervision on the manuscript, students still control the work they do. But in printing, humans be become part of a mechanical process. Creativity becomes a specialty of the type cutter or the page designer or the skilled pressman. And now our modern world has advanced to the point where the machine or the mechanical process has separated itself from humans entirely. Think of what is considered printing today for most of us at CSS. We push a button in one room and in another room a machine spits out endless perfect copies. But a hand press, like the one you will be operating today, still needs a human to interact with it, who understands how it works and by doing so is able to coax it to do its best. A press is like the engine of a coal-powered tramp steamer from the early 19th century with its greasy cigar-smoking mechanic or Scotty's beloved warp drive from Star Trek. <laughs> the machine still needs the human hand to make it work. Each letter of a book, uppercase or lowercase, Roman or italic, and every piece of punctuation starts by being carved as a negative image on a steel punch. And the light's a little dark in there, but you can see the punch is carved right down in here. It is believed that Gutenberg worked as a jeweler at one time, and you could see how this skill would apply. The punch is then used to create a positive image in the copper matrix, which is a solid piece of copper. That matrix is then inserted in a mold. I have to remember I should read what I did right here. That matrix is then inserted into an adjustable mold, the base of each letter being a different size. Historians believe that the creation of this adjustable mold is what Gutenberg figured out that made typecasting viable. The mold is then filled with molten lead alloy that cools quickly. And I read somewhere, too, that each letter, because it's a different shape, 
Here we have a picture from the 16th century of a man pouring lead into that tight mold. The lead needs to flow into the mold into each part of the letter. So each letter had its own designated shape that you did to make sure that the lead would go down into that particular part of the letter. Uh, once, the mold, once the type had cooled, the mold is snapped open and the letter is removed. Now, and this still staggers my imagination, each letter had to be filed to square and then to what we call type high, or the perfect impression. Each piece of type has to be the exact height. Letterpress printing is relief printing. The inked letter is pressed against the paper. If a letter is too short, it does not have enough bite and leaves a light impression. If the letter is too tall, then it will have too much bite and leave a dark impression. Once all the punches have been carved for each sort or symbol of the alphabet, matrix, matrices were created and then enough type had to be cast to start the letter by letter assembly of the page of a book. We have magically assigned the four, 1455 to the creation of the printed book based on a rubricator's note found written years later. But as you can see, the research and development would have begun years before. And I was trying to bone up in case I got to ask some questions like this. They think it might have taken up to two years for Gutenberg to create the punches and the matrices before they could start actually casting the type that would go into the particular book, that uh, his Bible that he's going to make. This is a 16th century engraving of a print shop at work which illustrates the basic roles involved in printing. You could take any of the individuals you see here and magically move them via time machine into print shops for the next 400 years or even into my basement and they would feel at home. <laughs> On the left, working from an exemplar or the, the master copy of the book, the composers are setting each letter of each word in hand by a composing stick. In the center and back, the assembled page is being hand inked using two buffs a le or leather bag stuffed with wool and attached to a handle. And the man would put ink out on a sheet and take these two round balls of leather and work them over the ink in order to apply that ink to the ball. Then he'd have to go over to the type and again rub it down and get an even coat over the, the particular page they're going to print. The ink page would then be moved to the press where the pressman pulls the lever and the wooden screw moves the platen onto the bed of the press and creates an impression. The third member of the printing team, in this case the young man in the foreground, removes and stacks printed sheets for drying. In the center left, the scholar or editor is proofing the sheets for error. And on the right, my guess is that standing there is the money man. For the whole operation, the owner of a printing house and printing has always been big business, and Gutenberg actually loses all the work that he does because of a loan that he makes to his partner that he can't pay back. The partner forecloses and takes over Gutenberg's printing shop, and he makes no money from his Bible. What we, what we are not seeing is that as soon as each page was printed, the type needed to be clean, unassembled, and returned to the type case for composing for another page. You've probably heard the expression, feed the press, and it, is liter and it literally means that. You did not want your skilled press team idle, and they needed to be fed a constant diet of fresh set pages to print. And we discovered this, too, when we were doing our book class. We'd have to, we'd try and print two pages a day, which involved two students setting a page each, me coming home in the evening, printing those sheets, coming back to work, then all the type had to be disassembled back into the case because the next two students would show up to print a page. And when we do that class, we have to keep up, we have to, we have to keep up a steady pace. There has to be two pages printed a day for roughly three weeks in a row or we fall apart. Uh, so it's quite fun so uh, being, so being a shop foreman. Oops, now I want to wait for just a second on this one. Bill and I gave a version of this talk two weeks ago at the Medieval Association of the Midwest Conference. And while we were printing sonnets, there were several comments by the medievalists on the legendary buffness of printers and whether any of us would be able to meet the standard in regards to pulling of the bar of the press. So basically, they're implying you had to be a real man to work a printing press, right? <laughs> Pull it back. Uh, so I'm concerned that there might be some of you in the audience who have spent time thinking about the buffness of printers and perhaps even losing sleep over it. <laughs> and while I am too modest to break out my own guns for you, I thought I would take you on 
the printers and their buff guns tour, <laughs> 400 years of burly men pulling the bar. <laughs> and actually, Bill had used this particular picture. We're going to go by century by century and look at images of, of people working in a press shop. Uh, this is a 15th century woodcut of a print shop. Since 1455 is the official date of the invention of printing with movable type, this image would be somewhat contemporary with Gutenberg and would be part of what is called the incunabula or the cradle of printing, which lasts for approximately 50 years. Books in this time have a beauty that have not been surpassed since. You can see here the composer setting type from his exemplar. One press is, pressman is inking the buffs and the second man is pulling the bar. And this image is going to remain fairly constant for the next 200 years. So here we are in the 16th century, and again you can see that triad of the composer, the inker, and the press man carries up through another 100 years of showing press work. The pre Notice that the press is braced against the ceiling and that the man pulling the bar has to brace his leg in order to do so. And some of the stuff, remember, I just like to print things. I don't always understand that. And I assume it could be you had to put so much torque on that bar that it could twist the press a bit off its, off its base, even though they seem very heavy. I assume that these two style uh, images, style-wise, come from the beginning and the end of the century. And I was actually quite amazed in the second because I thought there were actually women composing type, which I had never seen before. And they're the two people on the right side of the image, uh, uh, on the right hand side. But now that I've looked at it a second time, I can't quite decide whether or not that is the case, uh, whether it's just the, the way the artist has portrayed people in that particular image. We're going to move on to the 17th century. One, uh, the image on your left is from France, and the image on your right is from Germany. The French are printing playing cards. In the 15th century, there was a mysterious figure known as the master of the playing cards, who some have associated with Gutenberg. For there's a train of thought that printing playing cards was the inspiration for movable type. If you think about a face card, the only difference between suits is the pip in each corner. The thought is someone realized you could cut one block for the face card, then cut out the pip and replace it with each suit, spades, clubs, etc. as you go along. Then from there, the leap is uh, the leap is made to ask if the pips could be replaced, what about the letters? In the center uh, of this slide is an image of a 15th century indulgence. They were sold by the Catholic Church for remission of sin and were an impetus for the Protestant Revolution. There's speculation that the, before his Bible was printed, Gutenberg was printing indulgences. So this was printed before 1455, so printing exists before this magic date we have assigned that it suddenly exists. So playing cards and indulgence, indulgences, sin is always good business. <laughs> so here we are in the 17th century. This, this image then would be contemporary with the printing of the first folio, but this is a, a Dutch printing shop. It's not an English printing shop. Uh, uh, whoops. I jumped one page over. Okay, this is just a wonderful image with so much going on. Uh, first, it's just a beautiful, large shop. Uh, there's a bottle glass window in the right-hand side, which is very odd because it shows up in a lot of pictures of printing shops. And I don't know if it's just traditional glass at that time period. Uh, I actually have some at home. Uh, the press has become streamlined. It's no longer attached to the ceiling. And you can see that the screw has become very, very thin in this particular case. And attached on top of the press, you can see a mythical creature. Some might mistake it for a phoenix, but it is actually a griffin. And you can see the griffin is holding two buffs, and he's, he's ready to ink up the press uh, for the two pressmen. Uh, and I like this image because it really demonstrates the actual printing process. And if you look at the two men who are in front uh, uh, of the image, the composed page has been set on the bed and inked which the man is doing with the buffs. Next to the paper is being registered so that when it prints, it sits within inside the margins where it's supposed to be. And that man is doing it right there in the middle. They think one way you did is you took all the sheets of paper and you pricked through the seam in the gutter of the paper, and then you had corresponding pins on that piece of the plant, and you could put each sheet over those pins, and it would be in perfect register when it came out. 
the item that is standing very high at the end of the plaid that looks like a screen, that's called a frisket. And the frisket folds down over the sheet of paper you're going to print, and it serves like a mask to prevent any ink from getting on the white page. And then the frisket, which is folded on the paper, folds one more time so the paper comes face down onto the, uh, the inked type. Then I think it was called a rouse, which is basically a crank, slides the type underneath the platen, and then the burly press man steps back, he holds that bar, and he pulls it. And they said the early presses didn't have any counterweights. Uh, this particular press has springs, so when you pull the handle down and you make an impression, the press will, will automatically move back into a position to pull another one. So I'm not sure if you would have to pull the bar backwards again in order to get it to release. And I don't, Bill has actually been at the platen press and he might, uh, and pulled the bar yeah, there, yeah. yeah. You do yeah. have to encourage it back. You do have to encourage it back. Okay, we'll take that as an authority there. Uh, it needs encouragement. So now we're gonna, I couldn't find any 18th century pictures, but we're gonna hop up to the 19th century here in the portrayal of the print shop. And you can see the print shop has been sanitized and it's a world of pink and white and the air has lost the sweet smell of ink and mineral spirits in the morning. The emphasis is no longer showing how the work of printing is being done, but you can see in the background the basic process, which is now almost 400 years old, done by these natalie dressed young men has not changed from our first image. There's still a wooden press in the far back, and in the front there is a new cast iron press, and these were probably called an Albion press, too, and it's like William Morris would have used those in his, his Kelmscott Chaucer. Uh, the press I have in my basement is cast iron, and it's very, uh, cast iron is very heavy. If you even cook with cast iron, you know those pots can weigh a lot. And last, we're gonna hop up into the 20th century where we see a romanticized oil painting uh, of what printing used to be. Uh, at this time, new technology has started to replace the hand press. The press I have in my basement, which was cast in 1895, can be run by one person using a treadle, and if they are, if they are a skilled jobber, they could print 400 impressions in an hour on that press. Here, though, we have a romanticized version of press work, an oil painting commemorating Italy becoming the center of printing in the 15th century. We see the scholars examining the printed word which glows with light. But the buff press man pulling the bar has lost his team of workers and has drifted off to his happy place. <laughs> so I'd just like to tell you, we're gonna get up and actually have some fun here in just a second, but before we do that, I wanna tell you about the type that you're gonna be using uh, to print your sonnet here in just a minute. This is the anchor in the dolphin, the press mark or imprint of the great Renaissance scholar and printer, Aldous Minutius. Any printer worth his salt wants his imprint on his books. It shows pride of work, and of course, it is great advertising. So it's always considered a mystery that the most famous book Aldous is associated with, and here's an image from it, Hypnero to Machia Polyphili, or the strife of love in the dream of Polyphilus, did not contain his imprint, and his connection with it is discovered years later in an errata slip. The Hypnero to Machia has been called the most famous book that no one has ever read, and the first English translation of it came out less than 20 years ago. The great Victorian impresario, William Morris, considered it the most beautiful book ever printed and used it as a model for his masterpiece, The Kelmscott Chaucer. Gutenberg printed books, but his audience was readers of manuscripts. You can think of him in one way as not printing books, but making manuscripts faster. The printed book as we know it will evolve in Italy over the next 50 years in the Hypnero Tomachia Polyphili printed in Venice in 1495, is considered the moment the monochromatic book frees itself from the illuminated manuscript, the beauty of the page coming not from elaborate illustrations in gold leaf, but the harmony and simplicity of its type and black and white illustrations. So the type that you are going to be using to print your sonnet is called polyphilus. It is a facsimile of Aldous's type from 1495. The punches were cut by the Monotype Corporation in 1923, and pages printed with polyphilus have been overlaid on pages of the Hypnero to Machia polyphili, and they match uh, exactly. 
And because Gutenberg uh, was trying to imitate scribal handwriting, right, because his books needed to look like a manuscript, because of the concept of the Roman letter or an ideal letter hasn't been thought of. That's going to take another 20 years for uh, Jensen, a man named Aldous Nicholas Jensen, uh, to start coming up with those Roman letters. He creates, and this is uh, images of type that actually look like calligraphy. And part of those letters were called ligatures because scribes would use shorthand and they would combine letters. So that's what Gutenberg has to do when he creates type. So when metal type is being created, uh, those ligatures need to remain for basically physical, uh, physical reasons, like the FI and the double F. <laughs> uh, but this particular uh, type, polyphilus, is only one of the two that retained their very old CT and ST ligatures. And you can see in that uh, line from the uh, sonnet that we're going to only print, it still uses one of the CT ligatures. I get very excited about ligatures, so uh, <laughs> you should too when you come up and print your sonnet. Part of our colloquium today is in the honor of the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death and to celebrate the first folio. So, just like Edward Blunt and Isaac Jagger did in London in 623, let's print some Shakespeare. Up. We'll probably have to form a line. I'll pull the press over here. You're going to get to pull the handle on the press, press your sonnet, and then I have my two assistants, I believe, are here, Dr. Shivsky and uh, uh, Ms. Johnson. They're going to help you put your sonnet into an envelope and, and seal it with wax. Okay. 